One of the two semi-plenary presentations today is given by Lucy Powell from the University of Colorado Boulder, USA. The presentation is followed by a live panel discussion, including selected experts on the topic. The session is chaired by Jacqueline Skerpen from the University of Groningen, who will now introduce the speaker. You are all very welcome at this online semi-plenary lecture at the IFAC World Congress. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Lucy Pau. Lucy Pau is a professor at the University of Colorado at Boulder, and she received all her degrees in electrical engineering from Stanford University. The focus of her research is on engineering control systems, and then in particular with application ranging from atomic force microscopy to large-scale wind energy systems. Uh, the latter topic being a topic of her lecture today. She is a fellow of IEEE and IFAC, and she has received many awards, including the IEEE Control Systems Magazine Outstanding Paper Award in 2012, the 2015 SIAM Journal on Control and Optimization Best Paper Prize, the 2017 Control Engineering Practice Award from A Square C Square, plus some awards from the European Academy of Wind Energy and ASME Dynamical Systems and Control Division. She is a fellow of the Renewable and Sustainable Energy Institute since 2009, and she has done various activities for IFAC and IEEE Control System Society, such as, uh, for example, she has been the general chair of the American Control Conference in 2013. She has been a member of the Board of Governors of the Control System Society, and currently she is a, a member of the executive board of IFAC. I look forward to the lecture of Lucy Pau, and the title of her lecture is Going Big, Control Co-Design for Extreme Scale Wind Turbines. Greetings. Thank you for joining this presentation. I'd like to thank IFAC President Frank Algover, as well as the IFAC World Congress organizers for inviting me to give this talk. I especially appreciate all the extra efforts that the organizers have gone through in replanning the entire World Congress as this virtual conference. I'll be talking about the design and control of very large wind turbines. I'm at the University of Colorado Boulder, and these are aerial photographs of our campus. Now, due to the pandemic, I haven't really been on campus over the last several months. All in all, though, Boulder is a lovely place to be stuck in during this time. As you can see, in Boulder, we're at the foothills of the Rocky Mountains in the United States. If you're not completely sure where that is, let's take a quick look at the wind map of the U.S. Colorado is this rectangular state, and Boulder is approximately here. The closest major city is Denver, which is about 40 kilometers southeast of Boulder. The U.S. National Renewable Energy Laboratory, or NREL, is located in Colorado, and NREL's National Wind Technology Center is only about 10 kilometers south of Boulder. And that site is a great resource for us, and I'll be talking about some field testing we're doing there a little bit later on in this presentation. So from this wind map, we see that there are great wind resources in the center of the country. There are also very good winds just off the east and west coast of the U.S. Now, in the U.S., we don't have very much in the way of offshore wind farms yet. There's only one small commercial offshore wind farm just off the coast of Rhode Island approximately here, though there are many more wind farms being planned offshore. This is a great potential area for growth in the U.S. Now what I thought I would do is talk more generally about wind energy before diving in and talking about the design and control of wind turbines. So over approximately the last decade, the average annual growth rate of installed wind power capacity worldwide has been 17 percent. In the European Union, the average annual growth rate over this same time period has been 11%. The number one country in terms of installed wind power capacity is China, and they've had a phenomenal average annual growth rate of 36%. In the US, we're number two, and our growth has been at 15% per year over the last decade. Germany is number three, with an average annual growth rate of 10%. Now, together, China, US, and Germany have over 60% of the world installed wind power capacity. Now, another way that we can compare countries or regions is by what is known as wind penetration. 
And what wind penetration is for, say, a country is it's that country's percent of electrical energy needs that are being met by wind. In this regard, Denmark is by far the number one country. Over 40% of Denmark's electrical energy needs is met by wind energy, and this is an average across a year. There are times during the year where Denmark will reach 100% wind penetration, and at these times, Denmark's trying to export its excess wind power to neighboring countries that can better use that power at those times. The European Union is at about 14% wind penetration, and in Germany, over 20% of the electrical energy needs are being met by wind. Now, China, for all its installed wind power capacity, is only at 5% wind penetration. They have a very large population and hence a high electrical demand, and only 5% of that is being met with wind. In the US, we have lower population, but we tend to be energy hogs. And so unfortunately, we're only at 6.5% wind penetration. But some of this is to say that there's still a lot of room for growth. There are many regions, many countries around the world that have tremendous potential to increase their wind penetrations quite significantly. To discuss wind energy a little bit further, let's look at this three-bladed upwind turbine, which is the traditional wind turbine configuration. So the wind comes through the rotor plane first before going around the tower. Now the rotor includes the hub as well as the three blades. And the nacelle, which sits at the top of the tower, houses the drivetrain and generator. Now, as the wind comes through the rotor plane, due to the aerodynamical design of the blades, that generates lift, which causes the rotor to spin, and that spins the low speed shaft, and the speed is sometimes stepped up through a gearbox to a high speed shaft, which then spins the generator, generating electricity. And this is put on the power grid and transmitted to customers. Now, the back of the nacelle are typically an anemometer and wind vane. The anemometer measures wind speed and the wind vane measures wind direction. Unfortunately, these give rather poor measurements because the wind first comes through the rotor plane, gets somewhat altered before being measured at the back of the turbine. Furthermore, the anemometer and wind vane are each measuring at a single point in what's now a very large rotor plane. And so their measurements are not necessarily representative of the wind speeds and directions across this large rotor plane. So usually what's done now is these measurements are averaged over periods of time and really just used for supervisory control purposes. On utility scale wind turbines, there's typically a yaw drive that can actively yaw the turbine generally to try to make sure that it's facing straight into the wind. There are two main operating regions in wind turbines, and I'll try to explain these in the context of a 2.5 megawatt wind turbine example. So here we're plotting power as a function of wind speed, and this purplish curve is the power available in the wind for a turbine of this size. And this curve is a cubic function of the wind speed. The dark green curve represents the ideal expected wind turbine power that we want to have. We want the wind turbine to be producing this power and following up this curve uh, as wind speeds increase. Now, when wind speeds are very low or in region one, and due to bearing and friction losses, it's not considered worthwhile to be producing power from the turbine. Only when wind speeds pick up enough and cross the threshold do we move into region two operation. This is sometimes also called the low rated operation. Now the control goal in this region is to try to maximize power capture. And this is generally done with the generator torque controller. What the generator torque controller essentially does is try to decide how much power to pull off the turbine onto the power grid. If it pulls off too much power onto the power grid, then the wind turbine rotor will be spinning too slowly. If it pulls off too little power from the turbine onto the power grid, then the rotor will be spinning too quickly. And there's some optimal aerodynamic efficiency point that we want to be operating at. Uh, essentially, given a wind turbine design, there is a maximal power coefficient for the turbine, and we want to be uh, capturing that maximal fraction of the power available in the wind. So the green curve in this region is also a cubic function of wind speed. Now, as wind speeds further increase, we'll move into region three operation, which is also sometimes known as above rated operation. When we enter re region three, 
we're already producing the rated power of the turbine. And so we don't want to keep increasing the power of production in region three because eventually we'll burn out the generator. So the control goal in region three is to regulate the power capture at the rate of power. And this is generally done with the blade pitch controller. So the, this controller typically will pitch the blades more and more as the wind speeds increase in order to let more wind by so as to regulate the power at the rate of power of the turbine. Now there are three blades and three blade pitch actuators. So there are additional control goals in region three that typically are to try to minimize structural loading so as to minimize maintenance issues and to try to extend the turbine lifetime as long as possible. So as winds impact the turbine, the winds are almost never completely constant across the rotor plane. Usually they're higher wind speeds, higher off the ground, lower wind speeds down low. And there's usually some turbulence. And so the schematic is relatively representative of wind fields that come into a rotor plane. Now the main quantity that's usually measured and used for real-time feedback control is the rotor speed. When wind speeds are low, the generator torque controller is active and is essentially trying to indirectly control the rotor speed so as to ensure that the wind turbine is operating at its maximal aerodynamic efficiency point in order to maximize power capture. As wind speeds increase, we'll move into blade pitch control or region three. And here the generator torque controller is trying to regulate the torque at a constant level and the blade pitch controller is trying to regulate the rotor speed at a desired rotor speed. And we hope that that constant torque times that constant rotor speed will equal to the rated power of the turbine. Now these traditional control loops are feedback only controllers for wind turbines. Over the last decade, my research group has spent some time working on combined feedback and feed forward controllers for wind turbines, where we've worked with atmospheric scientists and remote sensing experts in trying to better understand how we can measure incoming wind speeds. And it turns out that LIDARs are pretty good sensors in this regard. They can be mounted inside a hub or on top of the nacelle, and they scan ahead of the turbine, providing that preview wind information that we can use in conjunction with feedback measurements from the turbine to develop combined feed forward and feedback controllers that can lead to improved performance over feedback only controllers. So I referenced those poor wind vane measurements earlier. Usually these wind vane measurements are averaged over many minutes and this information is then typically used by the yaw controller so that if there's a persistent error in yaw, the yaw controller will be activated to try to yaw the turbine so that it's facing more directly into the wind. Now LIDARs not only measure wind speeds, but they also measure wind directions, arguably better than the wind vane measurements. And so LIDARs can also be useful for improving the performance of the yaw controller. Now, combined feed forward feedback control of wind turbines is not the main focus of this talk, but I just want to highlight some of this as it's been a major area for my research group over the last 10 or so years. I also wanted to put in a shameless plug for my PhD student Michael Sinner's paper and presentation at this IFAC World Congress. Here we've been collaborating with our colleagues at the University of Oldenburg in Germany, and we've developed, simulated, and actually experimentally tested in a series of wind tunnel experiments, showing that a combined feed forward feedback controller does lead to benefits over feedback only control. Have we all been in Berlin now, we probably would have been planning to visit our collaborators in the time after the World Congress. But alas, this is not meant to happen this year. So the main focus of this talk is on the design and control of extremely large wind turbines. As part of a big team, we've been trying to develop a novel wind turbine rotor concept. So I'll briefly overview that and then discuss how our team developed an aero structural control co-design approach that allowed us to optimize the design of this novel rotor concept in order to meet a very aggressive milestone on our project. Then I'll briefly highlight some of the field testing that we're now carrying out to demonstrate this novel rotor concept. Finally, I'll briefly discuss a load-constrained power controller technique that we've 
developed that has been leading to very nice results. At the end, I'll summarize and briefly mention a number of areas of ongoing and future work in the broad area of control of wind energy systems. Based on the data that I presented earlier, the wind industry is actually relatively healthy. However, the pandemic has definitely wreaked some havoc in the wind industry as well as many other industries. We hope all these industries do recover. Now, the wind industry has always been trying to decrease the levelized cost of wind energy to try to become more and more competitive relative to other sources of energy. So LCOE is a way to compare the cost of different types of energy. So LCOE is equal to the sum of the costs over the lifetime of a power plant. And so this power plant could be a wind farm, it could be a natural gas plant or a nuclear power plant or whatnot. And we take the sum of the costs and we divide by the, the sum of the energy produced over the lifetime of that power plant. So the costs in the numerator include the capital expenditures. How expensive is it to put up that wind farm? The numerator costs also include the operating expenditures. How expensive does it cost to operate and maintain a particular power plant? Now, OPEX includes the costs of the fuel, which happen to be free for wind, solar, and hydro, but are not free for fossil fuel-based power plants. And in the denominator, we have the sum of the annual energy produced over the lifetime of that power plant. So to minimize LCOE, we want to minimize the costs in the numerator and maximize the annual energy production in the denominator. The wind industry has largely tried to drive down LCOE by going to larger and larger wind turbines. And over the last 40 years, wind turbines have gone from approximately 75 kilowatt machines now to eight megawatt machines that you can find offshore. And over this time, LCOE has generally decreased. Now, why does going to larger wind turbines decrease LCOE? Well, power is proportional to the cube of the wind speed. And as mentioned, there are higher wind speeds higher off the ground. And so by, by having taller towers, we can access those higher wind speeds and through this cubic relationship that really leads to quite significant increases in power production. Power is also proportional to the rotor area. So by having a taller tower, you can also place a larger rotor on top. And so for these and other reasons, there's been this progression to larger and larger wind turbines to drive down that levelized cost of wind energy. Now, can we continue to upscale though? It's generally believed that for upwind turbines, we're coming close to the limits these days. So this is a plot from a final report out of a series of studies done at the Sandia National Laboratories in the United States. And here they're plotting blade mass as a function essentially of blade length. Now in this series of studies at the Sandia National Laboratories, they were exploring 13 megawatt wind turbine designs with approximately 100 meter blades. They initially did an all fiberglass design, which ended up being very massive. And then through a series of innovations, including using advanced materials, they were able to decrease that blade mass quite significantly. Their final design is what we call Connor 13, which stands for conventional rotor, so your traditional three-bladed upwind rotor at the 13 megawatt scale. And we'll be referring to Connor 13 throughout this talk because in our novel rotor concept design that we're trying to develop, we want to be able to show that we're doing better than the best design, this Connor 13, out of this previous study. So even at this best design and through many designs over the years, it's very well believed that the blade mass is going to grow at least quadratically with the blade length for upwind turbines. And this is where we see some limit being reached because as blade lengths increase, the blade mass will get very large. So we need a lot of material, hence a lot of capital expenditures to manufacture the blades. And then these massive blades are very expensive also to transport and hoist up onto the turbine. So in a relatively large team project, we're trying to develop a novel rotor concept. What we're trying to do is to develop a two-bladed, lightweight downwind rotor concept. We're bio-inspired by palm trees, which are light and can morph downwind 
and can survive hurricane conditions. And we certainly want offshore turbines to be able to survive such conditions, especially off the east coast of the US. We're funded by the Advanced Research Projects Agency, ENERGY, or ARPA-E, in the US. And this has been a very exciting project. We call our novel rotor concept the Segmented Ultralight Morphing Rotor, or SUMER. And when we refer to SUMER 13, that's the 13 megawatt level SUMER design. Now, this has been a fantastic team and I've invited team members to provide perspectives and some of them have and I've included them throughout this presentation. So when we look at a conventional upwind turbine, the combination of centrifugal gravity and thrust yields these downwind loads that are pushing back on the blades. As those blades rotate, we have to be very careful that the blades do not strike the tower. As blade lengths increase, they have to be kept stiff enough, and that's what's really driving that at least quadratic growth in blade mass as a function of blade length, because we have to keep the blades stiff enough so that we have a high guarantee that the blades will not strike the tower as they rotate. By turning downwind, we can have much lighter weight blades. And these lightweight blades can then morph with the wind and essentially load a line with the net of the centrifugal gravity and thrust loads. By load aligning, we're minimizing the structural loading on the blades. We can encourage this load alignment by using downwind coning in terms of how the blades are mounted on, into the hub. So the idea then is in light wind conditions, the blades will be wide open, maximizing power capture. As wind speeds pick up, the blades will naturally morph and load a line, minimizing structural loads on the blade. And also by reducing that capture area in higher wind speeds, it's naturally regulating the power at these higher wind speeds. Now, there are a number of aspects in this rotor concept that we're only now more fully investigating in the phase two of the project. In the phase one project, we were focused on developing and demonstrating this downwind, load aligned with coning, very lightweight rotor concept. And I'll talk about this more over the next little bit. Now, the traditional wind turbine design process is relatively sequential. Usually the aerodynamical design of the blades are done first and then followed by the detailed structural layup of materials. Usually by the time we control systems engineers are involved, the wind turbines have essentially been designed and we're just asked to design the best controller we can to control this turbine, to try to maximize power production in region two and regulate power production in region three. Now, on this ARPA-E project, we set a very aggressive milestone for ourselves and we found ourselves needing to pull together and work more closely in what we now call an aerostructural control co-design approach. So the overall milestone that we set for ourselves is we wanted to design a SUMER 13 rotor where we could show 25% reduction in LCOE relative to the Connor 13. And because of this aggressive goal, we felt that that sequential design process was not going to do it for us. So ultimately we developed this co-design approach and our process looks more or less as follows. So initially we did use that sequential design process, came up with our initial SUMER 13 design. We developed a controller for it and then evaluated it using relatively high fidelity simulations and we simulated the system across a range of wind conditions in what are known as design load cases in wind energy community. So uh, we can assess the annual energy production, the structural loads, we use that information to further tune the controller and we also feed back this information to the aero and structural teams as they iterate and improve on the turbine design. Now, those of us involved in these processes had never really used levelized cost of energy as a direct performance metric. Now, in this project, we collaborated with our colleagues at NREL, where they can take parameters from the wind turbine design along with the performance, and with relatively detailed cost models, they can come up with good estimates of the levelized cost of energy which we then feed back and we try to iterate as a team 
to reduce that levelized cost of energy. After a few iterations, we quickly learned that increasing the annual energy production has the single biggest impact in reducing that levelized cost of energy. The goal of our research is to achieve innovative and optimized blade designs at the extreme scale, as we call it, that are feasible and physically realizable. Optimization of the blade structure is multidisciplinary, and with the strong team we have in place, we design blade structures within the control co-design framework to guide a blade toward the design objective. That is mass optimized and feasible extreme scale blades to maximize energy capture. So as Todd also mentioned, we have been working as a team in this co-design process, trying to improve the Sumer designs. We did that first detailed Sumer 13 design, which we call Sumer 13A. This design was done actually through that sequential process. The Sumer 13A has 101 meter blades and five degrees of downwind coning. In terms of rotor size, the Sumer 13A is about the same as the Connor 13. Then we went through this iterative process closely as a team, and we did a number of trade studies trying to evaluate many rotor designs throughout the design space to see if we can improve the Sumer design relative to the Sumer 13A. So everything here is going to be plotted relative to the Sumer 13A. We want to see if we can increase annual energy production while keeping structural loads below the unity line. So throughout this process, we developed simplified modeling and estimation techniques that allowed us to evaluate many more rotor designs more quickly compared to running detailed higher fidelity simulations. So each of the small dots represents a rotor design that we evaluated using our simplified modeling and estimation techniques. So we increased blade lengths and naturally saw that we could increase annual energy production, but it also tends to increase structural loads. We also varied what is known as axial induction factor. Axial induction factor, if you will, is a greediness factor. If it's set to one third, then the rotor is designed to be as greedy as possible. And this is the usual axial induction factor that is used in rotor design. Now we decrease the axial induction factor and what that does is it leads to more slender blades. It will decrease annual energy production and also decrease structural loads. Now because we wanted to try to keep annual energy production up, what we did was we decreased axial induction factor at the same time as increasing blade lengths and we try to increase the blade lengths enough to try to increase power production, but we also wanted to keep the structural loads down. And we found that overall we could, through a combination of decreasing axial induction factor and increasing blade lengths, we could overall lead to increased annual energy production while not increasing the structural loads. And this was very exciting to us. We also varied the cone angles, and here we actually considered both upwind and downwind configurations. Since the focus of our RPE project is on two-bladed downwind rotors, let's look more closely at the downwind configuration. So increasing that coning angle in the downwind direction will naturally decrease annual energy production, but also decreases structural loading. And if we look a little more closely, we see that Increasing that downwind coning angle to 20 degrees allows us to decrease the structural loading by almost 30% while only giving up approximately 8% in annual energy production. And this is a worthwhile trade-off. And so we took all of these trade studies and then assessed where we wanted to do the next detailed SUMER 13 design. And we call this next design SUMER 13B. It has 125 meter blades, an axial induction factor of one fifth, and a downwind coning angle of 12.5 degrees. And through, uh, we, as an entire team, we did the detailed Sumer 13B design and we assessed and evaluated it through high fidelity simulations. And we found that we did end up approximately where the simplified models and, and estimates predicted we would be. So this was very exciting to us because we were able to increase annual energy production by more than 10% without increasing structural loading. So we continued these trade studies, varied 
blade lengths, assess the ramifications in terms of blade masses and structural loads. We considered both two-bladed and three-bladed designs as well as upwind and downwind configurations. Again, the focus of the RPE project was on two-bladed downwind rotors. And so our final design there is what we call Sumer 13C. And it has 145 meter blades, an axial induction factor of a little more than one-fifth, and a downwind coning angle of 12.5 degrees. And it's this design that led us to our 25% LCOE reduction goal. We as a team worked closely and iterated on the Sumer 13 design until we reached this 25% LCOE reduction goal. And it's really that increase in blade length that led us to the significantly large increases in annual energy production. So the Sumer 13C led us to approximately 34% increase in annual energy production compared to the Connor 13. And it's that significant increase in annual energy production that ultimately allowed us to drive down that LCOE by 25% compared to the Connor 13. Now you might be wondering, well, we increased the blade length so much, doesn't that increase the capital expenditures? Well, it does, but not by so much. Now, it turns out that CapEx makes up about 75% of the numerator, and of CapEx, the turbine portion is about a third. And of the turbine, the blades is only a small portion of the entire turbine, because remember, there's still the tower, the nacelle, the drivetrain, the generator, there are many other components of the turbine. So the blades is just one portion, and by increasing the blades, in length as much as we did, we only increased the overall CapEx by 5%. Now you'll notice that there's a balance of system here that seems to be a big part of the CapEx. What balance of system is, is it includes the cabling in terms of connecting the turbine to the power grid. It also includes the foundation, which is quite significant in terms of installing that turbine either into the ground or all the way to the seabed for shallow water offshore turbines. Now, there are many aspects of this overall project that I won't have time to discuss. Let me just highlight the main tasks that we've done. So we first did our detailed initial Sumer 13 design that we call Sumer 13A. This was then Bravo aeroelastically scaled down to approximately 21 meter blades that were manufactured and were now field testing at NREL. As these blades were being manufactured is when we pulled together as a team, working very closely, iterating through many rotor design studies to reduce the LCOE by 25% relative to the Kana 13. We've now also upscaled and done a series of 25 megawatt sumer designs, and we've also further upscaled and have also done a series of 50 megawatt sumer designs. The summer project is pushing new frontiers in terms of size and power at 50 megawatts. In addition to laying the foundation for the next generation of wind turbine technology, the summer project is also laying the foundations for the next generation in computer modeling capability. The size and scale of the summer design is leading us to improve the relationships between the aerodynamic, structural elastic, and controller aspects of the modeling capability. These improved tools allow for a more accurate representation of a cutting edge design like the summer turbine. The improved modeling capability is essential to allowing us to begin to explore and quantify the benefits of co-design and controls co-design. These methods will result in the most cost-effective and optimized machines possible. I don't have time to discuss all the different aspects of our overall project, but I would like to highlight what we're doing with our field testing. Part of the goal of field testing is to evaluate and demonstrate this radically new two-bladed, very lightweight downwind design. There's a lot of uncertainty uh, in terms of its performance, and we were hoping to learn from and gather data from the field test so that, as Nick mentioned, we can improve our modeling and software tools so that in the future we can further improve future wind turbine designs. One of the challenges during a structural design is to find a balance between the level of detail that goes into the iteration as well as the constraints we define. And the challenge is the aeroelastic stability, which is a major focus of my research. The approach has led us to a structural design 
for an uh, initial summer 13i rotor having a 25% mass reduction and more work is ongoing. So in full disclosure, we did many more than three detailed SUMER 13 designs. As Mayank referred to, we also did a detailed SUMER 13i design. And it was this design that was actually gravel aeroelastically scaled down to 20% scale. So the SUMER 13i has approximately 104 meter blades and 12.5 degrees of downwind coning. Now, when we scale down to 20% scale, we call the scale turbine the SUMER demonstrator or SUMER D. Now, in order for you to be able to see the labels, I will label on a larger diagram of a turbine. The SUMER D has approximately 21 meter blades and we preserve that 12.5 degrees of downwind coning. All the 13 megawatt scale SUMER designs were done for a particular offshore site just off the coast of Virginia. So just off the middle of the east coast of the US. At this site, there are medium wind speeds and medium turbulence levels. Now the SUMER D is being field tested at NREL, which has very high winds and high turbulence levels. So we ended up having to do a few aerostructural control co-design iterations at this scale in order to ensure that the blades to be manufactured would survive the NREL site conditions. So this is an aerial video of the NREL National Wind Technology Center. The two medium turbines here are the Controls Advanced Research Turbines, or CARTs. There's a two-bladed CART, which we call CART 2, and a three-bladed cart that we call cart three. And we did our SUMER-D evaluation with the cart two platform. Now, the small building between the two carts is known affectionately as the control shed. We can see the cart two out one window and the cart three out another window of this control shed. The real-time control system is implemented in lab view and runs at 400 Hertz. And ultimately, we replaced the two blades on the CART2 with our SUMER D blades. Our SUMER D blades were manufactured by a company called Janicki Industries. They're located in Washington State, which is in the Northwest of the United States. Now these were very novel blades and Janicki had never manufactured anything like them. And it, there were a number of small and not so small issues that came up during the manufacturing process, which I won't get into. Ultimately, the blades were manufactured and transported to Enwell, where they underwent some ground testing before being mounted on the CART-2. Now, the CART-2 normally is an upwind turbine, and we had to reconfigure it for downwind operation. And this involved many details that had to be carefully attended to for proper downwind operation. Now, to implement the coning, we had to design an adapter, and then two of these were manufactured. And this allowed us then to install the blades onto the hub at the 12.5 degrees of downwind coning. Now, even though this is a 20% scale experimental demonstration, with approximately 21 meter blades, this is still a very large experimental test. And when things can go wrong, they will. And uh, so we had a number of challenges in getting to operational field testing. It turned out that ultimately our SUMER-D blades sat on the CART-2 platform for approximately a year before we could start operational field testing. And this is a video taken during that time when the blades and this rotor was essentially in a parked situation. Now, when there are winds, the rotor will still spin. And what you can see from this video is just how flexible these blades are. They're very lightweight, very flexible blades. The main challenge we had during the field testing was that we had large torque oscillations induced into the, from the pitch system into the drivetrain during a startup of the wind turbine. This was because of a model mismatch issue where uh, th that frequency was not captured in the model uh, that was previously developed. With that, we were able to filter out that frequency being fed into the system and then have a controller that would successfully operate this wind turbine. This is a key benefit for why you're supposed to, you should have field testing as part of a project. Uh, and it was a very exciting portion of this project because with field testing, you're able to find all those true dynamics that are not captured in modeling. 
And with that, you're able to take something from design and bridge that to something that will reach real world adoption. Now, as Andy mentioned, we have worked through step by step many challenges and debug things, and we are now fully under operational field testing since last November. And it's been a very exciting time gathering field data and analyzing it. So this is a video of the Sumer D in operational status. And you can see it's downwind relative to the two nearby three-bladed upwind rotors. And you can see that downwind coning. As the Sumer demonstrator gathers data in field testing, my role is to analyze this data from a controls perspective. So I look at generator speeds, power capture, blade loads, among other signals to evaluate the performance of the SUMA controller and compare it against what was expected from the simulations. I'm also looking at wind measurements from these field tests to create full field turbulent wind models to test possible improvements to the SUMA controller under similar wind conditions. As we move towards bigger rotors with segmented blades and outboard flap actuation, I intend to use the advanced control techniques that were developed as part of the SUMER project in a co-design environment to optimize the performance of these extreme scale wind turbines. Now, as Mandara mentioned, one of the data channels that we on the controls team were very interested in analyzing are the generator speeds. It turns out for all wind turbines, there is some maximal generator speed threshold that we do not want to exceed because if this threshold is exceeded, it will cause an automatic shutdown of the turbine, and then we'll really lose a lot of energy production, which we don't want to do. Now, our Sumer D controller overall has been working well. However, out of a couple hundred cases here, it turns out there were two overspeed events that did lead to a turbine shutdown. We're analyzing all of the data, but currently having a focus on trying to better understand what caused these overspeed shutdowns? What was the turbine status as this time approached? And what were the wind conditions? And we're trying to better understand these situations so that we can develop better controllers that would have prevented these overspeed events while still also performing very well across the entire operating region of the turbine. Now, as Mandar mentioned, there are many different aspects. We're trying to, also as Nick pointed out, we're trying to improve the models used in simulation and the simulation tools so that in the future we can improve the design and control of future wind turbines. Now we've developed a new control approach that we call load constrained power control. And we're trying to get away from the usual maximize power production in region two and regulate power in region three. Through our better understanding, in particular of the aero and structural design issues, as well as our improved understanding of LCOE, we've developed this load constrained power controller as an add-on to the existing controllers on wind turbines. Essentially, we try to assess the situation and determine if we're in a safe region far away from constraint boundaries that would trigger a turbine shutdown. If so, and we're in the safe region, we can try to be greedier and boost power production. So R, when it's one, then we're operating the turbine as usual. As R deviates from one, so as R increases, we're trying to increase power production. And as R deviates from one, we would change the set points to the normal controllers. So let's take a look at a set of time series. We have turbulent winds where here, the mean of the wind speed in this scenario is just below 15 meters per second. And the rated wind for this turbine is just above 10 meters per second. So at the beginning and end of this time series, we're in above rated conditions where the generator torque is constant and the blade pitch is active. In the middle of this time series, we, there's a lull in the wind. And so we move into region two control. The generator torque is active and the blade pitch is constant. There is a maximal generator speed constraint we don't want to exceed. And it's approximately 1400 RPM here. Now what's usually done is this speed constraint is lowered by some amount, usually somewhere around 20%. And this lower level is then called the rated generator speed. And we control systems engineers are asked to design a regulator to keep the generator speed near this rated generator speed. And if we do a good job, then the generator speed should be very unlikely to exceed this maximal generator speed constraint. Now this 
time series here is considered a relatively difficult situation where there's a lull in the wind that causes the turbine to move into region two operation. Then there's a relatively fast increase in wind speeds after that. And sometimes due to the blade pitch rate constraints, the blade pitch isn't able to pitch fast enough to keep up with the increasing wind speeds. And so we will find a peak in the generator speed that can come pretty close to that maximal generator speed constraint. There's also a peak in the rotor thrust that's highly correlated with when there's a peak in the blade loads. These results here are using the usual existing controllers. So R is equal to one here. Now with our load constrained power controller, what we do is we use the measurements from the turbine and try to assess the situation. Are we getting close to the constraint boundaries? Are we relatively far away? We also can use the turbine measurements to estimate the wind speed so we can see sort of what the wind conditions are. If we have preview wind measurements such as from LIDARs, we can improve this power-based controller. So when we're in a safe situation, we try to boost the power. So our max might be 1.1, where in safe situations, we're trying to increase power production by as much as 10%. Now, as the wind turbine state changes and we might be getting closer to constraint boundaries, then we derate as needed. So with this low constraint power controller, we end up with these red curves as results. And the dashed gray line here is what was originally the rated generator speed. And the dashed gray line in the power plot is the rated power of the turbine. Now, based on our assessment of the situation at the beginning and end of this time series, we're in relative safe situations, and so we can boost the power, and that naturally will boost the generator speed as well. Now, in the middle of this time series, we consider things to get a little more dangerously close to the constraint boundaries, so then we start to derate, and in fact, for a short period of time, R is actually less than 1. So in this period here, the low constraint power controller, the red curve, generates less power than the original controller. But at the beginning and end of this time series, the power has been boosted. And overall, there's actually more energy production across this time series with the low constraint power controller. And furthermore, we've stayed away, further away from that maximal generator speed constraint boundary. And we've reduced the peak in the rotor thrust, and that has reduced the peak in the blade loads. And so we have a win-win-win situation where with the load constrained power controller, we have overall increased energy production, we stay further away from the constraint boundaries, and we've reduced structural loads. Now my PhD student, Dan Zalkind, used this approach in his entry into last year's ARPA-E Atlas Offshore Wind Competition. And he ultimately won the $100,000 first prize, which of course was super exciting. Now, Dan Zalkind graduated in May 2020, and he's now working full time at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. So in summary, we've learned a lot from this multidisciplinary project where uh, working closely as a team, our aero structural control co-design approach really led us to further optimize designs that could reduce levelized cost of energy. We've also had our challenges with field testing, but now that we're underway in operational field testing, it's very satisfying and we're continuing to analyze the data. Much of the initial data looks relatively good, but we're trying in particular to focus on analyzing the anomalous data, where things did not go as well as we wanted to. We're trying to learn from this data so that we can improve future design and control of wind turbines. The low constrained power controller has led to very nice results so far and we believe can further minimize the LCOE. As we continue to evaluate the feasibility of extreme scale turbines, our team is building upon the summer work to further optimize the blade structure to make it more feasible for market acceptance. One of the aspects I'm focused on is a study in segmentation to achieve mass and cost effective solutions that further reduce the levelized cost of energy. As Alejandra alluded to, we are now in a continuing phase on the project where we're trying to develop and design two and three bladed lightweight downwind rotors at the 25 megawatt scale. Now Alejandra and the structural experts on the team are exploring 
blade segmentation further, and we're also exploring flaps, in particular outboard of the blades. And from a controls perspective, we believe that we can control the flaps in such a way that we can further mitigate structural loading on these extreme scale wind turbines. There are many areas of ongoing future work in the general control of wind energy systems area. One of the popular areas of research right now is control of wind farms. Wind turbines interact with each other through their wakes. And this is now a relatively famous photo of a shallow water offshore wind farm off the coast of Denmark. And we can see that lead row, winds coming in, and as that lead row extracts power from the wind, wakes are generated, or wakes develop. There are lower wind speeds and higher turbulence inside the wakes. So these rear turbines cannot produce as much power because they see lower wind speeds in the wakes and they also get beat up more structurally because they're experiencing higher turbulence levels. Now the usual way that wind turbines are controlled on wind farms is each turbine is controlled to be as greedy as possible and we're hoping that the overall wind farm power production will be maximized. Unfortunately it's relatively agreed upon now that that result does not happen. And we really need to coordinate the control of the individual wind turbines accounting for the wake effects in order to lead to better power production. And various studies have shown that the increased power production can be quite significant depending on particular scenarios. I was involved in some earlier studies in this arena. Let me just highlight the type of power increases that could be possible. So here we have two simulations. On the left-hand side is uh, the usual scenario. The turbines are facing into the wind and each one is being as greedy as possible. We developed a steady state weight model that we call FLORIS, which stands for flow redirection and induction in steady state. And essentially what it does is it takes incoming wind speed and direction and with knowledge of the wind farm layout and the yaw directions of each turbine, they can predict the power production of that wind farm. So we use floors to optimize the yaw settings for the turbines. And it turns out that you can yaw the turbine in such a way that you can try to steer the wakes behind it as much out of the way of that next turbine. And so when we optimized for yaw and we ran the simulation, these are very high fidelity computational fluid dynamics simulations using the SOFA code, which stands for Simulator for Offshore Wind Farm Applications. It's an NREL based code. And here uh, we see that because of the optimized yaw settings, the wakes are steered mostly out of the way of the next turbines and these rear turbines then see mostly free stream air. And now these free stream winds have higher wind speeds, and so that's what's leading to increased overall wind farm power production. And these free stream winds are also less turbulent, and that's what's leading to overall reduced structural loading. So we have a win-win situation, more power production, lower structural loads. And so there are many studies ongoing in the control of wind farms, there are many advances still to be made, such as, for instance, developing better weight models, developing dynamic weight models. Now, to actually implement wind farm controllers in practice, we need to have good measurements or estimates of the wind field across a wind farm. Now, if we deploy many lidars across a wind farm, that quickly gets expensive. So, a couple of my students are looking at less expensive methods for estimating the wind field across a wind farm. One student, Michael Sinner, is using those core anemometer and wind vane measurements that I referred to at the beginning of the talk. These measurements are readily available on commercial wind turbines. So can we use these measurements in conjunction with a simple dynamic model of the wind field and a common filtering approach to estimate the wind speeds and directions where we want to across the wind farm? So Michael Center developed this approach and has implemented it using actual wind farm data. And in this animation, the gray indicates the raw measurements from the individual turbines. And we see that sometimes they look quite spurious in some cases. And we actually think that those are, are faulty measurements in those cases. The green indicates the results of our common filtering estimates. And we believe that those are better estimates. 
Now, since this is actual wind farm data, we don't know what truth is. Uh, so we can't prove that we're doing better. We're hoping to combine this wind field estimation approach with a wind farm control approach and hoping to be able to deploy and test on a portion of wind farm where we hope to show improved power production over the usual wind farm controller. Another student, David Pasley, is looking at using inexpensive UAVs to gather wind speed measurements. So these UAVs would be instrumented with wind speed sensors as well as other atmospheric sensors. And then the question is, what are the information rich regions that we want to fly our limited number of UAVs through to gather information in order to estimate wind speed and direction? Now our initial results are quite promising, but there are many aspects of this approach that still need to be worked out to fully develop this method. I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that some of the best winds in the US are just off the coast. Winds offshore tend to be more consistent and they also are closer to large population centers. So there's a lot of interest in developing offshore wind. Around the US, most of our offshore wind is going to be over deep water. And this is actually true around the world. Most of the offshore wind resources around the world are over deep water. Over 99% of the current commercial offshore wind farms are in shallow water, where the wind turbines are built all the way down to the seabed. Now, as we want to develop more and more offshore, most of that wind resource is over deep water, and then it doesn't make sense to build wind turbines all the way down to the ocean floor. And so here we're considering floating offshore wind turbines. So imagine an inverted pendulum with a massive rotor at the top that's affected by winds and waves. There are obviously many challenging control issues. One of my students, Nick Arabas, has recently done an initial controllability and observability analysis of existing floating offshore wind turbine configurations. And there, of course, are some directions that are much more controllable than others. And so can we use this better understanding to develop good floating offshore wind turbine controllers? When we first set out to design the various components of a wind turbine, we found that controls are needed at most stages of the design process in order to properly analyze the performance of the turbine. So the first thing we did was set out to automate the control design so that whenever the plant was updated, we'd have an updated control design. And that is a kind of controls co-design. Then the next big effort was getting the various design teams thinking about how the turbine operates as a dynamic and controlled system in a way that meets our collective design goals. And so in the future, we're thinking about how the various software design tools that are used in design can also reflect that a wind turbine is a dynamic and controlled system so that we and others can use those tools to do co-design optimizations on systems that are even more difficult to control, like a turbine mounted offshore on a floating platform. As Dan alluded to, we are trying to further develop the co-design approach now in what's a an aero structural hydro control co-design approach for designing floating offshore wind turbines. Many of the existing platforms used for floating offshore wind turbines have been borrowed or adapted from the oil and gas industry and they tend to be large and massive. And so in this relatively recently launched project we're trying to design and optimize and tailor floating offshore platforms for the wind turbine application. We're trying in particular to keep them very lightweight. And then there are of course control challenges and can we still stabilize the overall system? Now one more area I wanna mention is active power control. And here we're trying to again get away from the usual maximize power production in region two and regulate power production in region three. As wind penetrations increase around the world, there'll come a point where the power grid can't accept all of that wind power being produced. And we might need to flip things around and allow the transmission system operator to provide a power reference command that they need in terms of grid balancing issues. And then we need to then control the wind turbines to produce that power and follow that power reference curve. So this is an area that we've worked in before where we developed active power controllers, we've analyzed stability issues, and then we were able to demonstrate our algorithm on the three-bladed controlled advanced research turbine at NREL. So in these selected experimental results, what we did is we derated the turbine by 10%, so then we could increase or decrease power as needed, 
and then based on power reference commands that were designed to help balance the grid, we showed that we could actively control the CART-3 to produce power following these power reference commands. And of course, they're natural extensions to wind farms. If you have a transmission system operator giving an overall power reference command to a wind farm, now the problem is how do we design and control the individual turbines coordinating among them to account for wake effects so that the overall wind farm power production follows that overall wind farm power reference command. Now I mentioned many different areas just in the control of wind energy systems area. Many people say that the wind industry is relatively mature, but I'm pointing out all these different areas because I want to point out that there are many challenges and many, many opportunities. Now, beyond control of wind energy systems, there are many grand challenges in the wind energy field. I was lucky enough to be part of this rather large team where we met regularly over about a year and a half and we debated and ultimately came to agreement on a number of key grand challenges that we feel must be addressed in order for wind energy to meet its full potential. And we think it will take at least three decades to fully address some of these key challenges. In closing, I really want to acknowledge our funding support from ARPA-E and NREL, as well as a number of funding agencies that have allowed us to explore many of these other aspects of control of wind energy systems. Solving such a multidisciplinary problem requires a strong team of experts from many disciplines, and this has been a really exciting team to work with. This project has been a great experience for me because of the core design and working with so many talented, hardworking team members. The project was very fortunate to have a number of talented individuals uh, and um, a passion throughout all the aspects of the project was certainly palpable. I echo Katie, Sepide, and Rick's sentiments in that the SUMER team has been fantastic. I want to thank those members that have provided perspectives that I've included throughout this presentation. And I also want to thank Chris Bay and Dan Zalheim for providing a number of slides in this presentation. And I also want to thank my research group. Due to the pandemic, we haven't been able to come together for an updated photograph this spring or summer. And this one's already outdated with uh, Dan having graduated and Mandar starting about half a year ago. But I want to thank all my students for providing slide material that has been used throughout this presentation. And last but not least, I want to thank you for listening. And I hope that you stay safe and healthy. And I look forward to meeting in person at a future conference.